It wasn't too bad. Oh, it is 61. iPad's at 42. See, that's fine. That's nice of it. As I say, they routinely below those numbers. Some high standard issues. Good. Okay, I see the nuns. Okay, great. Thank you. Thank you. Oh my gosh. Oh, I got a second. Good. Break my no talking during council meetings rule. <laughs> Is there glory for you in the mystery? Sure. Okay. 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 Mr. Mazel Tov. like to call this meeting of the Durham City Council to order uh, for uh, at 7 o'clock on April the 2nd, 2018. And certainly want to thank all of you all who are here in attendance tonight. Could you please join me now as we pause for a moment of silent meditation? Thank you. I want to ask Councilmember Reese if he would lead us in the Pledge to the Flag. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Good evening, everyone. We have some representatives from Boy Scout Troop 411 from Union Baptist Church here in Durham. If they would join me up front, that would be great to help us with the Pledge of Allegiance. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Thank you, gentlemen. Great job. Thank you. Thank you very much to our Boy Scouts and leaders and to Councilmember Reese. Uh, Madam Clerk, could you please call the roll? Mayor Shule. Here. Mayor Pro Tem Johnson. Here. Councilmember Alston. Here. Councilmember Caballero. Here. Councilmember Freeman. Present. Councilmember Middleton. Here. And Councilmember Reese. Here. Thank you. Thank you very much. And we'll now have the ceremonial items. Mayor Pro Tem, if you could come with me, and Councilmember Freeman. Good evening, everyone. Um, I'll be presenting the proclamation for National Fair Housing Month to uh, Mr. James Davis, our human relations manager. Whereas Title VIII of the Civil Rights Act, known as the Federal Fair Housing Act, makes it unlawful for housing providers to discriminate in the conditions for acquiring housing because of a person's membership in a protected class, 
And whereas this civil rights legislation was passed on April 11th, 1968, in the wake of the aftermath of the assassination of Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. one week prior, and whereas the month of April is recognized as National Fair Housing Month to celebrate the anniversary of the Fair Housing Act and to commemorate the life of Dr. King through the recommitment of providing equal housing opportunities in every community, and whereas the city of Durham is committed to providing equal housing opportunities to all residents through the enforcement of the Federal Fair Housing Act and the Fair Housing Ordinance of the city of Durham, and whereas housing discrimination incidents continue to be reported in spite of the local and national efforts to eradicate unlawful discriminatory practices, now therefore I, Stephen M. Shule, Mayor of the city of Durham, North Carolina, to hereby proclaim the month of April 2018 as Fair Housing Month in Durham and hereby affirm that fair housing is not an option, it is a right that should be availed to every resident and every community. Thank you again for the proclamation. I would invite you to come to the um, uneven ground exhibit that is out in the hall or in the lobby area of City Hall so you can see some of the history of the housing discrimination that occurred right here in the city of Durham. Out of love for the city and for one another, let us link ourselves together to continue building a city that eradicates discrimination and systemic oppression so that we can all be free. Thank you again. We have a lot of ceremonial items tonight, which is fun. Uh, and keeps us busy. Uh, the second one is for the Mayor's Challenge for Water Conservation. And uh, I believe I'll be presenting this to Wayne Drop. Is that true? <laughs> Come on up, Wayne Drop. Let me do that. I want to let you know that... Uh, do we have James here too? Okay, great. And James Lim, who's not quite as interesting as Wayne Drop. <laughs> uh, I will let you know that Wayne Drop and I uh, made a film, uh, filmed an, an ad on Good Friday uh, when Wayne Drop was supposed to be off of work, but 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 came anyway, and uh, you'll be able to see it on television, and you'll probably hear a little bit about it later. <coughs> National Mayor's Challenge for Water Conservation: Whereas the City of Durham continues to explore ways to manage residential water consumption to inspire its residents to preserve and protect our natural resources, especially our water supplies. And whereas the city of Durham, as an EPA Water Sense partner, encourages our community to conserve water and be water efficient whenever possible. And whereas the Wyland Foundation has sponsored the National Mayor's Challenge for Water Conservation for six years, promoting healthy competition among cities of all sizes across the nation to reduce water use by the adoption of water efficient behaviors and practices. And whereas from April 1 to 30, 2018, the city wishes to inspire its customers and its neighboring communities to participate in the challenge by making a series of online pledges to reduce their impact on the environment by decreasing water use and striving to be more water efficient for the period of one year. Now, therefore, I, Stephen M. Shule, Mayor of the City of Durham, North Carolina, proclaim that the city is an active participant in the Wyland Foundation National Mayor's Challenge for Water Conservation and encourage all Durham residents to take the conservation challenge between April 1st, 2018 and April 30th, 2018 by making a series of online pledges at mywaterpledge.com to reduce their impact on the environment and see immediate savings in the utility bills, this proclamation shall be effective immediately. Witness my hand in the corporate seal of the city of Durham, North Carolina, this, the second day of April, 2018. And now I'm gonna turn it over uh, to James uh, for a few words. So I'll speak on behalf of Wayne and water management. Thank you, uh, Mayor Shul, Council not just for the proclamation tonight, but also for actually challenging our residents to participate in this important cause. Uh, last year, 4,800 cities across the United States took part in this challenge, including Durham, uh, with residents making simple pledges to uh, be more water efficient and protect our watersheds. And I can assure you that all of those simple, easy uh, things that we're asking you to do as part of this challenge really do make a difference. Um, and if that's not reason enough to participate, it's an opportunity to win some really cool stuff. They're giving away $50,000 in prizes this year. Uh, so get your pledges in. You can do that by April 30th at mywaterpledge.com. Uh, encourage your friends and neighbors to do so as well. 
Uh, and you can follow our progress in the challenge by visiting durhamsaveswater.org or by following Durham Water on Facebook and Twitter. Thank you. <clears throat> All right, and our next uh, proclamation will be given by Councilmember Deidreana Freeman, National Service Recognition Day proclamation, which will be presented to Colleen Herbert, uh, Program Director, Eagle Court, North Carolina Central, Mike Shiflett, Advisory Council Member, uh, and I believe those are our two, do we have, are either of those two folks present? Great. And Delphine Sellers, it turns out, also. <laughs> So for National Service Day recognition or Service Recognition Day, whereas service to others is a hallmark of American character and central to how we meet our challenges, and whereas the nation's local leaders are increasingly turning to national service and volunteerism as a cost-effective strategy to meet their needs, and whereas AmeriCorps and Senior Corps participants address the most pressing challenges facing our communities from educating students for the jobs of the 21st century to fighting opioid epidemic, to fighting the opioid epidemic, to responding to natural disasters, to supporting veterans and military families, and whereas national service expands economic opportunity by creating more sustainable, resilient communities and providing education, career, and skills and leadership abilities for those who serve, and whereas AmeriCorps and Senior Corps Participants serve in more than 50,000 locations across the country, bolstering the civic, neighborhood, and faith-based organizations that are so vital to our economic and social well-being. And whereas national service participants and increase participants increase the impact of the organizations they serve, both through their direct service and managing millions of additional volunteers. And whereas national service representatives, a unique public-private partnership that invests in community solutions and leverages non-federal resources to strengthen community impact and increase the return on, a tax, on taxpayer dollars, and whereas national service participants demonstrate commitment, dedication, and patriotism by making an intensive commitment to service, a commitment that remains with them in their future endeavors, and, the co -op, and whereas the corporation for national and community service shares a priority with local leaders nationwide to engage citizens, improve lives, and strengthen communities, and is joining with the National League of Cities, the National Association of Counties, Cities of Service, and local leaders across the country for the National Service Recognition, Recognition Day on April the 3rd, 2018. Now, therefore, Stephen M. Shule, Mayor of the City of Durham, North Carolina, do hereby proclaim April 3rd, 2018 as National Service Recognition Day. And I'll just share a few words. Good evening. As a, a program director for one of the AmeriCorps programs represented in this proclamation, one of which is 18, there are 18 AmeriCorps programs in the city of Durham, and there are 40 locations, 40 different uh, either um, nonprofits or churches or other organizations that the AmeriCorps members serve. And we have 91 members who are serving in those various locations, adding to uh, the impact in the Durham community. So what this does also is bring $1.2 million, including educational scholarships, into the community as well. So we appreciate you um, providing this proclamation for us. Thank you. Good evening, I'm Delphine Sellers and I stand here before you to represent Senior Corps. This is really uh, an honor for me and I give you a little secret, especially today since it is my 65th birthday, mm -hmm. I feel doubly honored to stand before you. I thank you and the seniors in Durham County and worldwide, thank you for this proclamation and thank you for recognizing all that we still have to offer. Uh, and we have a lot to offer as seniors. And not only do we have a lot to offer the community, our youth, 
our community, our organizations, but it helps us also to remain vibrant and help us to remain engaged and help us keep going. So I thank each of you, Mayor, City Council, for this proclamation and let it be known that it is an encouragement to us seniors to keep on keeping on. All right, thank you. Thank you all so much. And uh, we are the beneficiary here in Durham of a couple of AmeriCorps members the, uh, who are with Keep Durham Beautiful and are doing a tremendous job. So we know how important that is. Uh, our next proclamation uh, is for, is for uh, Community Development Week as our Community Development Week proclamation. And uh, I believe that this will be presented to Reginald Johnson, our Director of Community Development. Reginald, nice to see you. This proclamation recognizes Citizens Advisory Committee. Oh, I'm sorry, I, I, I'm, I'm got that wrong here. What I'm, what I really mean is, I need to recognize the city, the, the uh, community, the Citizens Advisory Committee members in the audience. Would the Citizen Advisory Committee members in the audience please stand? Thank you. Uh, Reginald, do you want to introduce them? Yes. Or would you like them well, to? Well, you, you go ahead, and then I'll, I'll do it when I'm All right, that's great. Um, volu these are volunteer residents of our community who review and advise on the Department of Community Development activities, including the allocation of federal and local funds for our annual action plan. And our annual action plan public hearing is also tonight, uh, so you all will hear that as well. Uh, the Citizens Advisory Committee and the Department of Community Development staff will be participating in activities during the week that highlights some of the community development activities being carried out in Durham. Whereas the week of April 2nd through April 6th, 2018 has been designated as National Community Development Week by the National Community Development Association to celebrate the Community Development Block Grant Program and the Home Partnerships Program, and whereas the CDBG program provides annual funding and flexibility to local communities to provide decent, safe, an affordable housing, a suitable living environment, and economic opportunities to low and moderate income people, and whereas the HOME program provides funding to local communities to create decent, safe, and affordable housing opportunities for low income persons with over one million units of affordable housing, having been completed nationally using HOME funds, and whereas over the past five years, the City of Durham has received a total of $9,044,650 in CDBG funds and $3,999,852 in home funds, and whereas the City of Durham has used CDBG and home funds directly or in partnerships to address issues surrounding homelessness, including veterans' homelessness, to promote home ownership opportunities for low and moderate income households, to develop hundreds of affordable rental units for low and very low income households, to provide repairs to homes of very low income seniors, to help revitalize neighborhoods and to leverage millions of dollars in additional public and private investment within Durham neighborhoods. Now, therefore, I, Stephen M. Shule, Mayor of the City of Durham, North Carolina, do hereby proclaim April 2nd to 6th, 2018 as National Community Development Week in Durham in support of these two valuable programs that have made a tremendous contribution to the vitality of the city's housing stock and the economic vitality of our community. Witness my hand in the corporate seal of the City of Durham, North Carolina, this second day of April. 2018. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Uh, before the members of the CAC are uh, seated, I would like them to introduce themselves if you just say your name. Thank you. Thank you very much for your service. The Citizens Advisory Committee is appointed by the City Council and the Durham County Board of Commissioners to advise the Community Development Department on funding uh, such as CDBG and HOME. And we definitely want to thank them for their service. Uh, the Community Development Week is important for the City of Durham. Mm -hmm. We uh, will be recognizing and honoring the uh, programs that we have used uh, CDBG and home funding for, such as the Whitted School, which uh, houses seniors, uh, the Neighborhood Revitalization in Southside, also the Piedmont uh, Reynolds Project, which is also in Southside. We've done quite a bit of work, including Eastway Village, 
And so we in Durham have used our funding for, neighbor, for transformation. And this week is important because as communities all around the country are doing, having, uh, honoring their programs and recognizing their programs, it all rolls up to Washington. And so if you were paying, have been paying attention in the bill, bill that was just signed by the president, the funding for CDBG and home actually increased despite the conversation that occurred earlier. And it's because of activities that we're doing here in Durham, as well as activities all around the country. So I just want to thank the mayor and thank the city council for this recognition that this is important work, and we want to thank everyone for their service and their support. And finally, uh, we have the proclamation for Nat National Crime Victims' Rights Week. And I'm going to ask uh, Assistant Chief Delma Allen to please come forward to receive this proclamation. And I believe, Chief, that you are also in attendance tonight along with victim services staff members. Uh, who Would you like them to come forward as well? Uh, I would definitely love for them to stand up and introduce themselves. Great. Great. Thank you all so much for being here. We really appreciate it. Um, this year's national theme is expand the circle, reach all victims. And this observance is a way for communities to demonstrate their commitment to promoting and securing essential rights and services that are necessary for the recovery of victims and of witnesses to crimes. Uh, this year, Durham's police department's Hispanic liaison officer and the LGBTQ liaison officer will each be hosting outreach events with a goal of fostering strengthened police community relationships within their respective populations. For details about the week's events, residents can visit the police department website, www.durhampolice.com. And now let me read the proclamation uh, to be given to you, Chief Allen. Whereas Americans are the victims of 20 million crimes each year affecting the individuals and communities, and whereas years of investment in crime victims' rights and services have developed a system of victim response that can help victims recover from crime, and whereas reaching and serving all victims of crime is essential to supporting thriving communities because those who receive holistic services and support are more likely to remain invested in their communities. And, dedicate, and whereas dedicated victim service providers are working every day to meet the needs of crime victims, yet there are still too many victims without meaningful access to rights and services. And whereas many victims face barriers such as isolation, distrust of authorities, language limitations, lack of transportation or cultural barriers, they keep them from accessing the services and criminal justice systems that can help them recover from crime. And whereas the mission of the Durham Police Department is to minimize crime, promote safety, and enhance the quality of life in partnership with our community. And whereas the formation of the Durham, City of Durham Police Department's Victim Services Unit in 1997 demonstrates the department's strong commitment to providing essential services to victims and witnesses of crimes and to ensure that they are treated with respect, compassion, fairness, and dignity. And whereas, we must make a dedicated effort to expand the circle of those prepared to respond to victims and to link them to the resources that can help them recover. And whereas, the City of Durham Police Department recently implemented two full-time liaison officer positions to foster heightened outreach to both the LGBTQ plus and Hispanic populations. And whereas, engaging a broader array of healthcare providers, community leaders, faith organizations, educators, and businesses can provide new links between victims and services that improve their safety, healing, and access to justice. And whereas National Crime Victims Rights Week provides an opportunity to recommit to ensuring that all victims of crime, especially those who are challenge, challenging to, who are challenging to reach or serve, are afforded their rights and receive a trauma-informed response. And whereas the City of Durham Police Department is hereby dedicated to strengthening victims and survivors in the aftermath of crime, building resilience in our communities and our victim responders, and working for justice for all victims and survivors. Now, therefore, I, Stephen M. Shul, Mayor of the City of Durham, North Carolina, to hereby proclaim the week of April 8 to 14, 2018, as Crime Victims' Rights Week, and reaffirm both the City of Durham and the Durham Police Department's commitment to creating a victim service and criminal justice response that assists all victims of crime during Crime, rights, during crime Victims' Rights Week and throughout the year, and to express our sincere gratitude and appreciation for those community members, victim service providers, and criminal justice professionals, including the folks who are here tonight, who, who we appreciate so much 
who are committed to improving our response to all victims of crime so they may find relevant assistance, support, justice, and peace. Witness my hand of the corporate seal of the city of Durham, North Carolina. This is the second day of April, 2018. Chief. We thank you, Mr. Mayor, Council, for this proclamation. Uh, I'm going to keep this very brief. Um, this is an opportunity for uh, the National Victims Crimes Week is an opportunity for us to really do more education uh, as it relates to rights that our victims and witnesses have in this community. Uh, we have a strong group of advocates who, who every day go out and are passionate about their responsibilities in ensuring that our victims and witnesses of crimes in our community are very much aware and educated on what their rights and responsibilities are. Uh, you don't have to be a, a citizen of this community, you have to be a resident of this community. You have the rights uh, that are given by the state of North Carolina to receive certain compensations as a victim or witness of a crime. So every day, uh, this group strongly goes out with a passion to be a liaison and advocate for those people who have been victimized uh, within our community of violent crime. So we, again, thank you for this proclamation. All right, we had a busy ceremonial schedule tonight. Uh, are there any prior item, priority items by the city manager? I'm sorry, I, I missed announcements. Are there any announcements by the council? Council members, any announcements? Council member Reese? Yes, Mr. Mayor, uh, thank you. I hope my colleagues are doing well. Hope you had a good Easter. I'd like to announce that I am unalterably of the position that seersucker season begins on Easter Sunday. <laughs> and anyone who has a problem with that, the line will form outside the council chamber as soon as our meeting is done. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. <laughs> You said that last year, and I just have to disagree with you, Council Member. <laughs> here, here. Any other announcements? Just, the, Freeman. just an additional announcement to note that uh, for national service recognition, that East Durham Children's Initiative actually has the pleasure of hosting five of those AmeriCorps members as well. Great. Thank you. That's wonderful. Any other announcements? All right. Uh, we will now move on to priority items. Any priority items by the city manager? Thank you, Mr. Mayor, members of council. Good evening, everyone. No priority items. Mr. Attorney? Thank you, Mr. Mayor. No priority items. And Madam Clerk? Thank you, Mr. Mayor. No items. All right. Thank you very much. Um, we will now move on to the consent agenda. The consent agenda can be approved by a single vote uh, of the council. And all the items will be approved unless one is removed by a council member or a member of the public for separate consideration at the end of the meeting. And now I'll be reading the titles of each of these items. Uh, item two, Durham Cultural Advisory Board appointments. <clears throat> item three, FY 18-19 Budget Development Guidelines. Item four, U338 NC55 Austin Avenue Widening Supplemental Agreement. Item five, February 2018 Bid Report. Item six, Fund Balance Policy for General Fund and Operating Reserve Requirement for Water and Sewer Fund. Item seven, cell, lease, cell tower lease and license agreement with Sprintcom Inc. for 801 Ellis Road. Item eight, new leases at 807 East Main Street, Golden Belt for City of Durham Departments, Community Development and Neighborhood Improvement Service with Landlord LRC GB LLC. Item 10, street and infrastructure acceptances. Item 11, contract SWDR 2018-01, stormwater control measures, renovation and rehabilitation. Item 12, Supplemental Agreement Number 4 for North Carolina Department of Transportation, NC-147, Pedestrian Bridge, TIP Number U-4445. Item 13, Capital Improvement Project, CIP Ordinance Amendment for Carver Street Extension, ST-257. Item 14, Recycling Services for Electronic Equipment Agreement with Powerhouse Recycling, Inc. Item 15, Yard Waste Facility Operations Contract with Atlas Organics, LLC. Item 18 can be found on the general business agenda for public hearings. Item 20, resolution in support of public employees' collective bargaining rights and rights for employee organizations. Uh, and that is, those are the items on the consent agenda. Uh, I will now entertain a motion to approve the consent agenda. Move to approve. Second. Uh, is there any discussion? If not, Madam Clerk, will you please open the vote? Close the vote. Motion passes 7 0. Uh, Thank you very much. Morning. We will now move on to the general business agenda. 
yeah. public hearings. I have it. It's a slide. Yeah. Okay. Um, so, uh, Madam Clerk, oh, it looks like Technology Solutions is already over there working on it. Thank you. Do you want to take a voice vote? Anybody have yeah. one? Yeah. She's. Yeah. Well, why don't we do that? Why don't we take a voice vote? So we have a motion and a second to approve the consent agenda. All in favor, please say aye. Aye. Opposed, no. Thank you very much. The ayes have it. The motion passes unanimously. Thank you for that <coughs> suggestion. Now we'll move on to general business agenda public hearings. Um, item 18 is a resolution approving an installment finance contract and providing for certain other related matters. Good evening, Mayor and members of City Council. I'm Emily Desiderio, Treasury Manager in the Finance Department. Uh, this public hearing is being held to receive comment relative to the consideration of, of a resolution authorizing the issuance of limited, limited obligation bonds in an amount not to exceed $150 million. All of the details associated with the transaction have been previously provided to Council, and staff has no additional information to provide, but we're happy to answer any questions you may have. Thank you very much. You have now heard the report of staff, and I'm going to declare this public hearing open. And first, I'm going to ask council members, are there any um, questions or comments for staff? All righty. Is there anyone on the, in the public who wishes to speak on this item? Is there anyone in the public who wishes to speak on this item? I will just say that, uh, as Ms. Desiderio said, uh, we have had a discussion of this item uh, at our budget retreat, and we were able to fully discuss this, so much appreciated. Thank you. Thank you. I'm going to now declare this public hearing closed, and the matter is back before the council. We need to adopt the resolution authorizing the issuance of the limited obligation bonds. Do I hear a motion? So, so moved. Second. It's been moved and seconded that we adopt the resolution. Um, uh, Madam Clerk, will you please open the vote? Close the vote. Motion passes 7-0. Thank you. And good job on from Technology Solutions getting down there and saving the day. We appreciate that working. Thank you. Uh, now we will move to a supplemental uh, item which is our 2017 fourth quarter annual crime report presentation. And we will hear from uh, Chief Davis and members of her staff. We do have one speaker on this item, uh, and after the report, I will call on Chris Tiffany to, uh, to speak. Welcome, Chief. We're glad to have you. Thank you, sir. Good evening, everyone. Before I get started, I want to um, take a quick opportunity to introduce the executive team for the Durham Police Department. We've had some recent promotions, and we've had some recent elections. So I think it's important that you know who the individuals are that are leading different departments or different areas of the Durham Police Department. First, we have Deputy Chief Anthony Marsh. He is over the Administrative Investigative Services. We have Deputy Chief Todd Rose, who is newly promoted. He's over field operations. Assistant Chief Ed Sarvis, who is over Support Services Bureau. Assistant Chief Terrence Simbley, who is recently promoted. And he's over Patrol Services Bureau. Assistant Chief Kevin Cates, who is recently promoted. And he is over Investigative Services Bureau. Our Analytical Services Manager is here tonight as well, Jason Sheese who will be reporting on traffic stop data. And our public information manager is also with us tonight, uh, Mr. Will Glenn. Thank you. How about Chief Allen? Did you want to introduce? Did I leave Chief Allen out? Where uh, are you? Community <laughs> services. <laughs> you messed me up. <laughs> I'm so sorry. And Chief Allen, who's of the community services division. So tonight I'm going to not just go over the fourth quarter sort of a high level of the fourth quarter, but also to do the annual crime report for you. Um, we're gonna start with our um, performance measures, our six performance measures in the police department is part one violent crime, part one property crime, part one index crime, 
clearance rates, response times to priority one calls, and staffing levels. So part one index crime is a total part one violent crime and part one property crime. Index crime was up by 2% in 2017. There were decreases in homicides, robberies, and burglaries in 2017 compared to 2016. Our reported burglaries were at a 20-year low. Homicides in Durham were down for the year 2017. This chart illustrates the annual Part 1 violent crime and Part 1 property crimes per 100,000 residents. This is a good depiction of the overall downward trend over an 18-year period. The Part 1 violent crime rate dropped 11% since 2000. The Part 1 property crime rate dropped by 49% since 2000. This particular chart illustrates last year's trends by the week. It illustrates the weekly crime changes compared to 2016. As you can see, you've seen this chart before, some of you, and at the beginning of the year, we had a significant uptick in violent crime. But as you can see, during the year, we had um, a nice steady, thank you, we had a nice steady downward trend towards the end of the year. Part one violent crime includes reported homicides, rapes, robberies, and aggravated assaults. Mm -hmm. Violent crime was up just slightly as we close out the year by approximately seven crimes for 2017. Homicides were down by 50%. The robbery task force, which was formed in 2016, can be credited for the arrests of several individuals responsible for the increased number of pedestrian and commercial robberies in the Durham area. This centralized unit arrested 121 people and cleared 241 cases in 2017. With the assistance of the Durham County DA's office, many of those arrested were charged with committing multiple robberies, not just connected here in the city of Durham, but in other jurisdictions as well. We also continue to work closely with our federal partners on cases involving violent gun crime. In 2017, the Federal Bureau of Alcohol, Tobacco, and Firearms and Explosive, ATF, as, as it's known by acronyms, adopted 84 cases from the Durham Police Department with 95 defendants for federal prosecution. Cases included armed drug trafficking, armed career criminals, armed robberies of commercial businesses, and carjackings and firearms trafficking offenses. There were 28 homicides in 2017, but the official number is 21 due to three 2016 and four 2017 cases being cleared as self-defense in 2017. Two of the homicides involved domestic violence. Six cases from 2017 remain open. Rapes were up by 28%. There was no indication of any serial type cases uh, last year, no, nor does the increase appear to be the result of increased numbers of stranger sexual assaults. I took the privilege of highlighting those numbers from 2016 and 2017, the 103 as opposed to the 132. It's our assessment uh, that victims now are feeling safer. I think we've had this discussion a little bit before and more comfortable in reporting sexual assaults to law enforcement in part as a result of the Me Too movement. And the reason we feel this is um, the case is because last year, uh, around the mid part of the year, we had a significant increase in belated sexual assault reports. As we started looking through our data, we discovered that um, in the year 2017, we had 19 belated sexual assaults reported. And in 2016, there were only six belated sexual assault cases. The other um, caveat to that is that the cases were not just from last week. 
reported belated. They were belated from sometimes six years, three years, two years, a few months, but it was significant enough for us to see that individuals are obviously feeling more comfortable coming in and reporting crimes that may have occurred some time ago. The 132 rape offenses represent 5.8% of the total violent crimes in 2017, which did impact the over, so overall percentage increase. Um, Council Member Reese, you and I kind of talked about that. Uh, it did impact the overall percentage increase, which sort of put us in a, um, even though we were half a percent up, those additional cases uh, made a difference as well. Uh, we have quite a few help services for our sexual assault victims. We have a sexual assault response team, our SRT team, our crisis intervention uh, team members, and also we work very closely with the Durham Crisis Response Center to make sure our victims get the type of follow-up that they need in order to uh, get through these various types of incidents. The difference of the 12 cases alone, um, as I mentioned before, would have probably changed our violent crime numbers just slightly. We experienced also a slight increase in the number of aggravated assaults, but the number of multi-victim firearm incidents dropped by 13% from 181 incidents in 2016 to 158 in 2017. But keep in mind also that um, not all victims in these incidents are actually injured. Sometimes uh, they're considered a victim just by virtue of the potential that they could have been injured. This chart illustrates the number of times a firearm was discharged during various types of crimes. 2016 versus 2017. So to explain the colors just a little bit, uh, of course the chart shows that in the red you have your aggravated assaults, in the green you have vandalism where a uh, property, a vehicle, or a home, or some type of property was actually struck by a weapon where a gun, uh, a gun was used. Uh, weapons use, that could be a situation where there were um, shots fired, no one was hit, no vandalism or anything, but we still did a police report based on the fact that a weapon was used. Robberies are in the blue, and then our homicides are also in a lighter color blue. These are all incidents where firearms were used. Part one, property crime. Part one, property crime includes burglary, larceny, and motor vehicle theft. Property crime was up by 3% in 2017. Our burglaries were at a 20-year low. We did have increases in larcenies and motor vehicle thefts. The increase in larcenies was mostly due to motor vehicle break-ins, keys in vehicles, vehicles running, as mentioned before in other forums. We continue to urge everyone not to keep items such as electronics, cash, purses, uh, many of the things that we've mentioned before in plain sight uh, to tempt individuals to break in cars. Uh, we created a safe car checklist as an initiative to hang from the interior of vehicle, vehicle mirrors to remind motorists of crime prevention steps they can take in order to make sure that their, their vehicles remain safe. We provided this um, sort of prevention mechanism in English and in Spanish. Part one, cry, property crimes. Uh, again, our motor vehicle thefts uh, increased during 2017 and more than 40% of the cases, the keys were left somewhere inside the vehicle. More than 40% of the cases. And as you can see, we had a decrease in uh, burglaries, larcenies up 6%, vehicle thefts 10%, and property crime overall 3%. We 
We compare our department's clearance rates to other departments our size. In 2017, our population grew, and we are now in the category of cities with population from 250,000 to 499,000. The 2016 FBI statistics are provided because the 2017 numbers are not available yet, so we're using these clearance uh, rates just for comparison. Our clearance rates were better than the averages for homicides, rapes, burglaries, larcenies, motor vehicle thefts, and overall part one property crimes. We had 882 aggravated assault incidents in 2017 and 1,256 victims, which are the offenses. As explained before, one incident may have 10 offenses. The difference in the clearance rate between incidents and offenses is caused by multi-victim incidents, which tend to be non-domestic and involve a firearm. Our experiences, many are, are gang-related, uh, many are drive-by shootings, and sometimes retaliatory in nature. This category has, uh, has uh, tends to have a very low cl clearance rate because of the uncooperative spirit of the individuals involved, whether they're victims or the suspects, many times um, associated with gang activity. There were also more of these type cases in 2017 than 2016. Clearances for domestic incidents was 73%, which sort of shows the difference in the ease of being able to um, solve some of those types of incidents, and also incidents without a firearm being involved. That number was 51% clearance rate. Priority one calls for service. There were 9,311 priority one calls for service in 2017, which was a slight decrease from 9,373 calls the prior year. Our average response time was 6.2 minutes, which was below the target of 5.8 minutes, but an improvement over the 6.3 minutes in 2016. We answered 52.1% of our priority one calls in less than five minutes in 2017. Although that did not meet our 57% target, it was an improvement from the previous year of 51.2% in 2016. Our staffing levels at the year's end. Our sworn staffing was at 93% filled at the end of 2017. We currently have 95% of our sworn positions field in the Durham Police Department. We currently have 27 recruits in Basic Law Enforcement Training Academy and an additional 18 new BLET recruits graduated in February of 2018. We tested 290 potential BLET recruits in 2017, which was a 15% increase over the 252 tested in 2016. Our recruiting unit participated in more than 75 job fairs throughout the country in 2017. We also are working to add early pre-hire recruits to the department to encourage them to stay with DPD and not go elsewhere. Most of our recruits are in processes in other uh, places as well with other departments. We are still taking ALET applications. The ALA application is for our lateral officers, individuals who are already state certified working with some other agency that want to come to the Durham Police Department. We have an abbreviated academy for, for those individuals, and we call it the ALET training. DPD hired 80 sworn officers in 2017, which was a 70% increase over the 47 hired in 2016. The average sworn attrition rate in 2017 was 4.75 per month. How do you divide a person up into a quarter? <laughs> the average sworn attrition rate was 5.67% per month in 
per month in 2016. Our non-sworn staffing level was at 89.5% at the end of 2017. It is currently at 89%. DPD hired 17 non-sworn employees in 2017. This is a pie chart that I thought would help illustrate the current demographics of the Durham Police Department. 66% of DPD sworn officers are white, 27% are African American, 6% are Hispanic, and 1% are Asian, Native, Native American, and other nationalities. Durham's percentage of female officers is at 17%, which is higher than the national average, which is 13%. We continue to enhance our recruiting efforts and setting goals to better diversify our department. So some of the highlights um, for 2017 in the fourth quarter, DPD employees, both sworn and non-sworn, participated in numerous community outreach holiday initiatives during the fourth quarter. They handed out crime prevention holiday safety tips to make the holiday season brighter for our residents and safer as well. We deployed two new dark blue specially designed vehicles for our uh, liaison officers so that they could be readily identified in the community. These vehicles that are illustrated there look very different from the regular patrol cars. And these particular vehicles have emblems um, to represent the LGBTQ community and also um, Hispanic community with um, Spanish language uh, on portions of the vehicle for our uh, Hispanic community. On October 4th, residents from throughout the city met with officers at various locations to have friendly conversations, ask questions about our work. This was part of the coffee and cop initiative uh, that took place several times last year besides the fourth quarter. During October, we celebrated Crime Prevention Month by holding various events, including uh, one of our favorites, the seniors versus the police over at a local senior citizen um, home and the Durham Police Department gets beat every year in every game. <laughs> but it's always fun. Uh, probably more fun for us than it is for the residents there. Um, our sworn officers uh, completed a mandatory eight-hour mental health first aid for public safety training class during the third and fourth quarters of last year. As DPD's comprehensive approach to mental health awareness, the class is designed to address the law enforcement population and provide a general awareness of mental health issues. On many occasions during the year last year, some we've discussed uh, where our officers utilize these skill sets in de-escalation of force and also um, crisis intervention and um, negotiating with individuals that are, were attempting to commit suicide, um, identifying uh, when it was appropriate to use communication skills in various types of volatile situations and we will continue with this type of training as we see that it is very impactful in the way we do our work every day. The DPD currently has 217 officers that are crisis intervention certified, which translates to 45% of all sworn personnel and almost 50% of all uniform patrol. This is well beyond the national standard of 20% as set by CIT International. Our community engagement unit is now working in the McDougal Terrace housing community. The unit, which consists of two supervisors and eight officers, was formed this year to build trust with community res residents, attend meetings, address quality of life concerns, respond to calls for service, host educational symposiums, and provide other community policing duties. We plan to eventually expand to other Durham Housing Authority communities in an effort to build strong relationships and reduce crime. 
Our Police Athletic League is being expanded into a full-fledged dedicated unit. The program offers basketball, baseball, and soccer. Last year, we added a successful golf mentoring program, and we anticipate adding a track program this year. Last year, we outfitted all sworn officers from the rank of captain below with body-worn cameras. The department's VView Solutions site is currently housing more than 136,000 interactions in nearly 24 terabytes of storage. Average video length is just over 10 minutes. Body-worn camera evidence was provided in about 800 criminal and internal cases in 2017. The department is preparing to begin a pilot test of VView's next generation body-worn camera, the LES. Use of force investigations. Our use of force investigations, both department-generated and citizen-generated, decreased in 2017 compared to 2016. The number of department-generated investigations dropped by 22%. The number of citizen complaints dropped by more than 50% during 2017. The number of taser deployments also dropped in 2017. There were 15 in 2016 and eight in 2017. In an effort to assist the investigation and successful prosecution of certain crimes, the Durham Police Department will review applications for U non-immigrant status. This program is known as the U visa process, and it is the process for victims of certain crimes who are currently or who have previously assisted law enforcement or who are likely to be helpful in the investigation or prosecution of criminal activity. By reviewing and certifying applications, the department seeks to secure the assistance and testimony of crime victims who may otherwise become unavailable due to their immigration status and their, their reluctance to participate in the process with law enforcement. On January 15, 2018, the Durham Police Department updated its U visa policy for certifications. Historically, most cases were denied due to a lack of workable leads. The new policy allows for qualifying cases less than four years old to be certified even if the case is inactive. As a result, more requests for U visa certifications are being received and more are being approved. As you can see, the first quarter, first three months of this year, there's a significant increase in the numbers submitted and also the numbers that were actually approved. And that concludes my presentation. And should we ask, answer questions now or would you like to? I think, uh, I think we'll, I think follow we'll, up presentation as well. Okay. Oh, there is a follow up presentation? Yeah. Actually, it's the traffic stop data. Oh, great. The analysis, a, a, a brief analysis of last year's traffic stop data. All right. I think before we hear that, we'll hear Mr. Tiffany because I believe he's probably going to comment on the report and then we'll do the traffic stop data report and then we'll have questions from council and comments. Absolutely. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Thank you very much, Chief. Thank you. Um, Mr. Tiffany, you have three minutes. Chiefs Lopez and Smith both told city council in work sessions, we don't have to document use of force against pedestrians. And students commuting to Durham Tech and NCCU were not allowed to speak or to complain to city council when signed up to speak in the committee room or in the more public council chambers when racial profiling was on the agenda. From mayor, city manager, police chief on down, the complaint process is riddled with problems that would get people fired in the private sector. Complaining is often ineffective and can be dangerous. And just a few days ago, another cop told me they still don't have to document use of firearms, pulling weapons on pedestrians, but you place the responsibility for use of force reporting on civilian complainants? You can't possibly take use of force reporting seriously when you still don't require cops to document use of force against pedestrians. 
and complaints are obstructed top down and bottom up. Durham One Call professionals can take, file, track, and track complaints for any department except the police department, which can make complaints and complainants go away. Listen to the ABC 11 town hall meeting at NCCU. The chief said she'd love to hear more about letting Durham One Call professionals do their jobs, but off camera, she's like police and politicians who make complaints and complainants go away. It's like, don't tell me, I don't wanna know, or you don't care to know. Is that what it is, you don't care? How can you manage a department when you let your employees keep secrets from you? Willful ignorance is irresponsible. Don't blame bad cops for bad management. Thank you, Mr. Tiffany. All right, uh, and now we have a follow-up report on the uh, traffic stop data. Good evening. Good evening. My name is Jason Sheets. I'm the analytical services manager for the police department, and I'm going to be providing you our 2017 traffic stop report. Uh, the intent is to give you a high-level trend analysis of our total traffic stops, our searches, and the contraband that is discovered as a result of those searches. So first of all, in 2017, we had 11,578 total traffic stops in the city of Durham. That's a 22% decline from the year before in 2016 and a 64% decline from 2010 when we had just over 32,000 total traffic stops. Excuse me, I'm sorry, would you suspend just for a second? Do you have any graphics? That, did you intend on having graphics up on the? Yes, it's up on this screen. I'm not sure. There, here we go, all right. Yeah. I'm sorry. Thank you, forgive me. My apologies, I didn't know Absolutely. it was uh, not Absolutely. up there. Um, so just. Again, quick review, 22% decline in 2017 over 16, 64% decline from 2010. Uh, of those 11,578 stops in 2017, 58% of the drivers were black, 39% of the drivers were white, and 10% were Hispanic. Those demographics are relatively unchanged over the eight-year period that you see in, in this graph. But as you can tell from the, the line graph, the overall uh, reduction in traffic stops has been pretty continuous over that eight years, other than a slight increase in 2013. Something else that we track is the general reason for the traffic stop, such as uh, safe movement violations, speeding, and two of those categories are vehicle equipment and regulatory violations. In 2010, 39% of the total traffic stops came from these two categories combined. In 2017, that ratio had declined to uh, 26%. The most frequent reason for the stop in 2017 was speeding at 45% of the stops. Next is the total searches by year. Uh, when total traffic stops go down, then you would also expect total searches to also go down, and that is what we have seen over the eight-year period. Uh, but there's a, a bit of a bifurcation in this particular graph. So from 2010 to 2013, things are relatively stable and constant. Uh, these are major uh, search categories. There are other types of searches that can occur, but they're much less frequent and have remained relatively unchanged. So first I'll direct your attention to the green line, and that represents the multiple search type category. Uh, this occurred predominantly prior to 2015, in which an officer was able to select more than one type of search in the computer software. Starting in 2015, they were no longer able to do that. They had to pick only one type of search. Most of the situations in which this occurred were a combination of both consent and uh, probable cause searches. So you'll see that that line has now dropped down to zero in 2017 from the high point in 2012. The next line I'll draw your attention to is the blue line, which is the consent searches. This has also seen a very dramatic and regular decline over the eight-year period, 
with the most dramatic decline occurring from 2013 to 2015. In 2010, we had 823 of these types of searches, and in 2017, there were only 34. And then finally, the red line is the probable cause searches. Starting in 2013, and really from 2014 up to 2015, there was a spike in this category, and then it has come back down. When you're looking at this data, I think it's helpful to look at the 2013 period for all three categories and compare that to 2017. You'll notice that probable cause searches are relatively the same in 2017 as they were in 2013, but the other two categories have dropped dramatically to near zero. So there's, there's a couple of things at work here. Um, one is the change in that multiple search category where that's gone down to zero and an officer had to pick either probable cause or consent or whatever the predominant search was. Another thing going on here was a policy change in October of 2014, and, and that was when written consent to search became policy. Uh, those two items together have had a significant impact on uh, this data since then. This is now the percent of stops with a consent search. So the previous slide was total stops and this is now a ratio. So uh, the top number being the total number of stops with a consent search and the bottom number being uh, the total number of stops. So again, there was a change in our policy in October of 2014, which contributes to this data. And what you see is that, and for all three of the racial and ethnic groups, the predominant ones, black, white, and Hispanic, the highest ratio was observed in 2011, with black drivers being at 3.79%, uh, white drivers at 1.78%, and Hispanic drivers at 2.66%. However, in 2017, those ratios have come down uh, significantly, less than a half a percent. So for black drivers, 36 out of every 10,000 stops results in a consent search. For white drivers, 22 out of every 10,000, and Hispanic drivers, 33 out of every 10,000. And all three of those groups are now very close together in those rates. So significant declines over especially the period from 2013 to 2017. I'll also point out that the hit rate, uh, which is essentially contraband that is found as a result of the search, that has gone up from uh, the last few years. In 2017, 26.47% of consent searches resulted in contraband being found, and that's up from only 11% back in 2014. This next graph is the percent of stops with a probable cause search. So it's the exact same as the prior graph, except that we've switched from consent searches to probable cause searches. A very different story here. So for um, really in 2013, as we started seeing increases where it was relatively stable prior to that. For 2016, that represented the highest percentage for both white and Hispanic drivers. In 2015 was the highest percentage for black drivers. Again, a large impact on this is likely the change in the policy and also the fact that the multiple search types went away and officers had to pick only one type of search. The hit rate for probable cause searches has remained relatively stable. In 2017, 44.5% of probable cause searches resulted in contraband being found, which is only sli down slightly from 2014 when 45.42% resulted in contraband being found. This puts everything together. This is all types of searches put together as a rate of traffic stops. So the additional line is the purple line, which is all drivers put together. So when you take everything and combine it, 4.21% of all traffic stops in 2017 resulted in some type of a search. What you also see here is that for all major demographics represented, 2017 was the low point over those eight years. While black drivers, uh, while searches with black drivers occurred at a rate 2.8 times higher than that of white drivers in 2017, the total number of searches for black drivers dropped significantly. 
from 650 in 2016 to 390 in 2017. That's a 40% decline in total searches for that particular demographic. Finally, we get to uh, contraband. So this is the total percent of searches with a hit. The definition of a hit is defined as any search in which contraband is found. That could be money, drugs, weapons, any type of contraband, and as regardless of whether it was the type originally being sought for the search. What you see here is a significant increase over the last four years in that overall hit rate. And the lines have nearly converged for all major demographic groups. They're nearly all together in terms of the total hit rate from those searches. What you also see here is that in 2017 compared to 2013, there's a 10% uh, higher percentage rate in 2017 for these hits. So the searches that are occurring are better quality searches that are producing uh, results in the way of contraband being found. So in summary, uh, traffic stops are down significantly over the last eight years. The overall search rate in 2017 at just over 4% is the, also the lowest over the last eight years. And the hit rate for searches has climbed steadily over the past four years. So the, the major takeaway is that there's less traffic stops, there's less total searches, when those searches are occurring, they're better quality searches that result in contraband being found as compared to prior years. And that's all I have. Mr. Shees, thank you for an excellent and very interesting report. I'm, I'm looking forward to uh, getting the data. and I'm sure the manager will make that available to us. Um, council members, we've heard two lengthy reports, and I'm now going to ask you all uh, for any questions, uh, how would we like to do this? Maybe we'll start with the traffic stop, stop data that's fresh in our mind. Maybe we'll, uh, we'll uh, ask questions about that first. So I'm gonna ask any council members with questions or comments about the traffic stop data and search data. Council Member Reese. Yeah, if I could, uh, Mr. Sheets, I'd prefer just to comment about the, the exact data, but any of the other uh, maybe components of that, I think G. Davis would be better prepared to, uh, to respond. Sure, absolutely, thank you very much. Council Member Reese. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. <clears throat> Again, Jason may, may respond to some of the data questions, but I didn't, didn't want him to necessarily have to respond to the policing questions. Got questions. it. <laughs> Y'all can. We're going to be a team. You oh, can no. tag team it. <laughs> and you, you, exactly. Okay. Council Member Reese. Mr. Manager, that's well taken because I suspect some of my questions will be more on the, more on the chief's purview. Absolutely. Um, first of all, thank you for that. For both those presentations, the traffic stop data uh, was particularly interesting. Um, first of all, uh, would love to get that presentation. Obviously, the mayor said the data, but I'd love to get that presentation. I was after swiping the monitor, trying to go back slides, <laughs> working for me. Um, but if I if I remember what we saw tonight uh, correctly, um, what I th thought I saw was that um, as between black and white drivers when they're stopped on, in a traffic stop that black drivers are almost three times likelier to be searched, whether it be written consent, probable cause, or whatever. Is that, and at the same time, the hit rate is almost identical. Does that sound right? That is correct. So 2.8% 2, 2 times more likely for a black driver to be searched than a white driver in 2017. And yes, the hit rate is nearly the same for all of those groups. Great, I think the next question is probably for Chief Davis. Unless we accept the premise that um, African-American drivers are driving around giving off more probable cause to search than white drivers, um, but having contraband at almost identical rates to white drivers, what do you think is responsible for the disparity? Well, as we continue to look at the data and continue to scrub the data and make it apparent to our officers that we're paying attention to the numbers and the types of of stops that they're making, the locations that they're making stops. Um, you know, uh, of course, we have problems in certain areas where we, we depend on our data to make sure that our officers are patrolling in those areas. The probable cause stops, of course, are up significantly compared to, they, to, to the numbers that they have been in the past. 
which means to me that they're making more quality stops based on probable cause. Uh, the ratio or the numbers is, is a question that I think we'd have to look closer at the data to see whether or not we have any other problems or any other disparities that would say that an officer might have a tendency to search one car uh, more, more so than another. Looking at the numbers, I understand where your, your question originates from, but these are the types of analysis that keep us digging <coughs> further to see whether or not there's some other things that we need to look at. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Councilmember. All right, other, other council members on this, on the traffic stop data? It's my fault. Council Member Freeman. I, I just wanted to know specifically on the traffic stop data within the city limits for the Sheriff's Department, do you get any of that? Is that included in your data at all? No, ma'am. This is just City of Durham Police Department data. Okay, could you go back, uh, Mr. Sheese, to um, the slide where the, the one of the very first slides which was the uh, overall reduction in searches that one right there i'm sorry in, in stops yeah uh so in 2010 we had 32,000 stops in 2017, we had 11,000 stops. So we're, we had about a third, roughly a third as many stops in 2017. And then could you go to the search, the total searches as well? And so again, uh, you, you highlighted the year 2013, uh, where we had about 1,300 searches and and then in 2017 we had about 400 searches is that right about 1300 searches were down about 400 yes, searches. so you know i think i think that's really important and really worth noting and i want to uh, first of all i want to just say um when we put in our written consent search policy it was controversial and um uh, I think that it was, you know, we saw what happened the, the very first year out with the um, with their probable cause searches uh, surging, but now have settled back down to a level even, um, well, below 2013 uh, before we had this new policy. And so I just want to say that I really think that Durham is a leader in this. And I want to call out a couple of my council colleagues uh, Councilmember Middleton and Councilmember Reese, who were uh, two of the advocates before they were on City Council uh, for this written consent policy, and I think it's really serving us well. Um, the fact that we are having uh, fewer searches uh, and a <clears throat> significantly higher hit rate uh, is a good combination. And I want to thank you, Chief, and I want to thank the whole department for how you all are carrying out this policy, because I know it's hard to make a significant change like that. It was really a kind of a cultural shift, uh, but I think that you all have done it. And I think it really matters to thousands of people, uh, literally thousands of people, uh, in terms of the number of stops and searches that we're having in the city. and so. I really wanted to highlight that. That's an enormous change, an enormous change in the lives of thousands of people. Um, I do think that the, uh, I appreciated uh, Council Member Reese's question. I think this is something that we need to continue to pay attention to, is the racial disparity in the stops and searches. Um, but for all groups of people, and that then and then that especially means uh, our minority communities, uh, because it's down in every area. Uh, I think that we are doing a trying to do a different kind of policing now, and I think that uh, it, it, that these numbers are a, a tremendous uh, tribute to that. So I want to thank you, Mr. Mayor. Mr. Mayor, Mr. Mayor, thank you, sir. If, if I might, thank you. 
um, for, for the shout out to Charlie and I. And I, I want to just say, and I know uh, that uh, Councillor Reese would agree with me that we were part of an incredible coalition of voices in this city, chief among them the Fade Coalition, who were working tirelessly. Uh, some of us may have gotten more headlines or recognition, but there were hundreds, thousands of people uh, who pushed really hard uh, on getting written consent and the other recommendations uh, passed as well. So uh, I certainly appreciate uh, the, the shout out, but, but I would be remiss not to point out uh, the Faith Coalition and others who, who fought so hard and valiantly on this. With that said, I, I also do wanna just, um, it was very dramatic seeing the spike in probable cause searches after written consent was uh, initiated. And there were many of us in the community that speculated that some of our officers were just getting creative. Um, now that you had to have a, a receipt, so to speak, to have a written consent, um, there were many in the community that were concerned that uh, probable cause became more probable and you had more cause now that you had to get a receipt for written consent. So I'm, I'm glad to see the numbers uh, come down. I wanna echo in the spirit of, of Councilor, I wanna piggyback on Councilor Reese's uh, question with just a statement. Um, while we've made progress, there's more work to be done. Chief, we're grateful you're here and to this command staff and I know, I know a lot of you personally, I know the values uh, that this command staff um, has. Um, but let's continue to just keep the work going and continue to, uh, in, in, in our culture, our police culture in the city, to, to make it known from the top down that Durham, this council, this citizenry just will not countenance uh, any treatment other than fair treatment and across the board treatment for any of its citizens. This council simply will not countenance it. Um, and the patrol level officers need to know it and command level officers need to know it. And chief, I think you've done a marvelous job in modeling that and this command staff. And um, as long as we're working towards that, you'll have no fiercer allies, I think, on this council than, than many of us up here. Um, but if we don't, it's gonna be, we're gonna be a problem. Um, me chief among them. Uh, but I'm heartened by the work that's been going on. I'm heartened by the cultural change. And it's not, it's not easy. It's hard work uh, to change the culture, but I am heartened by the work that is, that's been done and, and the way the numbers are moving. And let's keep them moving that way and let us know if we can be helpful. Thank you. Thank you. Council Member Reese. Just briefly, <clears throat> Mr. Mayor, your mention of equipment and regulatory violations reminded me of another question I had for the chief. Um, the presentation we just saw indicated that a quarter of the traffic stops that were initiated in Durham during 2017 were for equipment and regulatory violations. Do I have that right? Is that about 26%? Yes, sir. Great. Let me go back to that. Are those, those are almost always, um, it's less than a misdemeanor. I was a prosecutor. I know that I should know this word. Thank you. Thank you. I'm horrible. Infractions. Those are almost always infractions. Is that Thank right? Thank you, Chief Service. I feel <laughs> bad. I feel bad. <clears throat> Is that right? They're most always infractions. Yes, they are. Um, is, have you considered the possibility of, um, encouraging officers to do something other than a traffic stop for that kind of equipment and regulatory violation. I know uh, at least one other community in North Carolina has tried this recently. City of Greensboro um, began doing something different and finding other ways to notify drivers of those kinds of violations other than a traffic stop. Uh, I also know Greensboro changed its mind earlier the, uh, last year um, and began uh, traffic stops again for those types of violations. Uh, it occurs to me that um, it might be a little bit more paperwork for officers to note the type of violation and the license number and then have a follow-up process um, by which that driver is notified of the violation. Um, but it's just another way that we can um, try to manage these numbers a little better. I wonder if you have any thoughts on that. Well, I do. Um, of course, the officers use their discretion as it relates to what types of infractions or citations they write. But on many occasions, our officers stop individuals just to let them know. Many times, people don't know that the brake light is out or whatever the case might be. Um, and sometimes, you know, officers go so far as to assist individuals on how to correct these things. But that's part of that culture that, you know, we're talking about. We're, we're, we're more interested in public safety than um, putting an additional burden on somebody who can't afford to deal with, you know, a, a vehicle or equipment failure or something of that nature. 
So um, to, to your point, um, I'd be willing to look at what other agencies are doing, looking at best practices to see if there are some other alternatives out there that are working for other cities, other jurisdictions um, to, to potentially bring that here. I'm, the other uh, thing that comes to mind is that for uh, most folks in our community, getting pulled over by a police officer for a broken taillight tail is not a big deal. Um, but for a number of members of our community, specifically those uh, who may be undocumented in our community, uh, that kind of traffic stop is, uh, is a, can be a pretty big deal. Um, and if there are ways that we can reduce those kind of interactions over something so minor as an infraction involving an equipment violation, I'd encourage you to take a look at it. Um, in addition, I just want to uh, piggyback a little bit about uh, on what uh, Councilmember Milton and the mayor said uh, about where the statistics are heading on traffic stop data. Um, the, aside from the uh, disparity that I asked you about uh, at the beginning of the questioning, I want to say that, uh, echo the mayor and say that the numbers are otherwise amazing. Um, they do uh, show, uh, point to a true culture shift and how we are engaging in these types of interactions with our residents um, as a police department. And I know that, that this is a change that happened before you got here, um, that started before you got here, but that it's something that you've bought into. And so I wanna thank not only you, but also your command staff and every uh, patrol officer that's out there doing the hard work of being a police officer in this city. Um, the, the numbers uh, show that this a change in attitudes and in policing uh, strategy is is working, um, and uh, I'm I'm really excited about that. And I also want to echo what Councilmember Middleton said um, that as long as we keep making progress, we will uh, be in your corner uh, uh, all the way. So thank you for everything you're doing on this. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Thank you. <clears throat> and could I say before we leave off of this this subject, um, I, I think that the feelings and the positions that are shared tonight are mutual amongst my command staff. Uh, these are individuals that work daily to take a close surgical look at their staff to make sure that we're treating people fair. We're constantly looking at data. Jason Sheets, I can't thank him enough for being able to extract this type of data for us to examine. Some agencies don't even look at data like this. So um, we don't just extract it, we're using the data so that we can take a closer look in ways that we can make changes. But I have to commend the staff because they oversee all of these officers and they make sure we do um, our work the way it should be done every day. And I can't say how proud I am of their agility in the changes that have taken place in the Durham Police Department since I've been here. Thank you very much, Chief. Mm -hmm. And um, Mr. Sheets, thank you so much for your report. It was excellent. <laughs> and we have work to do, uh, but we have made a tremendous amount of progress, and it's really appreciate your analysis of it. Thank you. Yes, sir. And, do you and, need her presentation back available? Say one more time. You want to go the, back the to questions, the Chief's original Chief presentation? Davis, uh, the, her presentation uh, the Chief's available? presentation, sure. Uh, we may have some questions on that. Thank you so okay. much for you, Chief. Oh, absolutely. Um, so, council members, uh, questions or comments on the chief's uh, first report on the fourth quarter annual, uh, fourth quarter and annual crime report presentation. Mr. Mayor, council question. member Alston. Thank you. I have a question and a comment uh, briefly. When are you are you ready? Mm -hmm. um, for the mental health training that you referenced, is that a one-time training or is that something that will that's continually available to? No, it is not a one-time training, and we plan to continue it annually. <laughs> We've had. Uh, several different renditions of the training, some in the classroom, some, some um, that, that was actually offered on the computer, mandatory for all of our officers as well. But we continue not just to have the regular mental illness training, but also we're working to have all of our officers crisis intervention certified as well. So it's ongoing. Terrific. Thank you. Um, and just a comment. It's in your report and not in the presentation, but I just want to uh, acknowledge the great work that your department's doing to refer people to the misdemeanor diversion program. Um, so I appreciated those numbers. And while it's not uh, directly within the scope of the department's responsibilities, I just want to say that you know that that program is a great program, and you know I think has the potential to um, have a positive and meaningful impact on on folks of any age. Mm -hmm. So I just hope that we as a community can move towards. 
um, expansion of that program in the future and just want to thank you for your the department support thank you thank you very much councilmember Austin other comments and questions I have a question councilmember Middleton thank you mr. mayor chief um from the drop from 2016 to 2017 of citizen complaints for violations of the use of force <coughs> policy over almost 50 some odd percent what why do you think that is I think a, a combination of, of things I think is you know, a shift in, in culture, a shift in, you know, what we see around the country, um, you know, officers being more cognizant of, of other options and, and alternatives to use of force. Uh, the training that we're providing, the de-escalation training that we're providing, we are um, currently looking at less lethal munitions as well to implement in the Durham Police Department. If you're not paying attention, you know, I think officers get it. Um, and if you don't have to use force, then you shouldn't. So uh, I think utilizing some of the training, you, utilizing commands and, and putting distance between yourself and a person who could be potentially volatile or dangerous, I think there are a lot of different scenarios that are uh, playing out right now. And um, the department continuously holds our supervisors accountable for making sure that any time an officer uses force, whether there's a complaint or not, we initiate the investigation to make sure that the officer um, utilize the appropriate protocols and policies and procedures in the use of that force. Thank you. Mm -hmm. And let me know if this is privileged information, but has, has Assistant Chief Kate said anything to you about an ice cream truck? <laughs> You let me know if this is privileged. I don't know. Did you mention an ice cream? <laughs> I didn't mean to start anything, but uh, I know he had some ideas about Dig deeper cream. on that one. Okay. <laughs> Thank you, Chief. Thank you. Chief, how about body cameras? Does that have anything to do with the use of force reports? Well, and um, to, to that point, when I said several things probably have something to do with it, I, I believe so. I think um, our officers and community members are more cognizant of being recorded during their interactions, you know, with, um, with police officers. So um, videoing always uh, sort of adjusts the behavior of an officer who knows that any um, infraction or any wrong behavior will be evaluated and there's some ramifications for, for it. So it's, I'm sure, shaping behavior on both sides. All right, uh, any other questions or comments? Councilman Police. Uh, Councilmember Caballero. Yeah, I just wanted to, um, is this the first time that the U visa uh, information has been added to the crime report? It absolutely is. So I wanted to say thank you. Uh, I think it's valuable information, and I am very impressed with the data that I'm seeing here. And uh, I, I know that the Latino community specifically is, is very encouraged by this. Well, good. Thank you. Thank you. Um, Come here. Yeah, uh, check Councilman Reese. Yeah, I was going to, I sure. wanted to let her go first. Yeah, so when she did, now it's my turn. Thank you. <laughs> uh, Hi, Chief Davis. Hello, sir. Um, have you received any requests uh, to view body camera footage from city residents pursuant to the general order that governs these things? I don't think we've had, I've asked recently, I ask all the time, and we okay. have not had requests as of yet. Media requests, anything like that? Oh, that's right. There was an insurance company that made a request probably. Do we accommodate that? That's good. No. Awesome. I don't think there's, I don't think the statute allows it. So no. that's good. Um, <clears throat> the use of force complaint data is uh, very encouraging. I think that's fantastic. Um, but I only heard one actual statistic about use of force itself, and that was in taser deployment. Mm -hmm. right, you noted that there was a decline in taser deployment uh, in 2017 over last year. Is that right? Yes. Does the department track other uses of force? Yes, we do. Um, they track it. Uh, however, it has to be sort of broken down. We use, um, we use a system that tracks it. But I do have some information here that might help shed some light on some of our numbers. 
Let me make sure I got the right slide. <clears throat> Duty. Um, at least I thought I had it. Let me see. Uh, you know, I thought it was here. Um, this is more demographic information. Um, however, um, I can get that information for you to break down those numbers to see whether or not it was soft hands or whether or not it was, you know, some other type of deployment of, you know, um, an aspiton or, or something of that nature. And do you have any sense of what the what those data would tell us about use of force in 2017 versus 2016? Um, you know, off the top of my head, I, I don't. But I would hope that it would show the continuum of force, you know, that we are utilizing different techniques, different types of, you know, um, ways to mitigate a situation without using extreme force. Chief, I, um, I'm all done with difficult questions, but I did want to say just a few things about the longer report uh, that you, you and your staff put together. It's always fantastic. Um, I did want to point to the continued progress the city's making, specifically the police department, in reducing um, drug violations. Um, that number has almost cut in half from 2015 to 2017. I think part of that has to do with uh, the increased use of the misdemeanor diversion program, uh, which again, uh, as Council Member Alston mentioned, is a fantastic program and we really appreciate your support of it. Another, I know, has been um, the encouragement of officers to use other means other than criminal charges to address some of those misdemeanor drug charges. And so uh, I just want to say, as a member of the council uh, that's been concerned about that for a while, it's great to see those numbers and where they are. And I know that um, it's a credit not only to you, but your command staff and the folks that are in the field. Um, I also wanted to mention, if I can get over here, on page 22 of your report, you know, you guys do a great job putting together um, uh, specific instances of officers going above and beyond the call of duty. Mm -hmm. um, I wanted to call out officers Hunter and Beckett of the CAT unit uh, on to page 22 of your fourth quarter report. Um, They're specifically called out for a couple of instances of homeless outreach. Mm -hmm. um, over the last couple of months, I've been fortunate, uh, really lucky to uh, get to know some of the folks that live at one of the homeless encampments here in town. And they've had a number of encounters with uh, Durham police officers over those months and they have uh, been uniformly positive. Um, and I know that has not always been the case uh, in interactions between the Durham Police Department and our uh, homeless neighbors. And so I just wanna thank uh, your department uh, for the way that you are treating uh, our neighbors and residents who don't have a stable place to live. It's really important to me personally, and I know uh, uh, many folks in the city feel the same. Uh, and just, I, I, again, that's really important to me, and I, I thank you for doing that. Thank you. We have a great crisis intervention team. Thank you. All right. Any other questions? I have a couple of comments. Um, this is this is the Passover season, Chief, and in Passover we have four questions. Uh -oh. But I actually don't have four <laughs> questions tonight. I was just I was just trying to scare you. Um, just a couple of comments, and and really to. I, uh, Charlie mentioned already the, the extent to which the drug violations are down. Uh, that's great. Uh, and uh, Renetta mentioned the misdemeanor diversion program and how important that is. Uh, and um, and then also, and Javier mentioned the U visa statistics. And I want to thank you for bringing us a new U visa policy. Uh, we've needed a new U visa policy for a while. Uh, and I just want to thank you for what you've done to usher in that policy. And I know that uh, I've heard from some of our advocates about the improvement in the policy, and I think it's gonna serve us well. I think it's gonna help keep our community safer yes. because people will feel like they can come out of the shadows and that they can report. And, and, they, will be, and they will be fairly treated for that. And so I, I appreciate it. Um, and then finally, uh, just the, the, you had a slide in here that we um, did not have previously to that, uh, that, we not, that we did not get in our original report, which is the diversity of the force. Yes. Uh, and um, I think that continues to be a concern. I appreciate all the recruitment efforts that we're making. 
uh, to diversify the force, but uh, we need to, of course, be continuing to do that, and I just want to put a punctuation mark on that. Absolutely. Um, and, and finally, though, I, I just think, you know, if you look at the big picture of this report, um, the, the very first chart in the report is the, is, the, is the raw numbers by which crime has gone down in Durham over the last 20 years. Is that, is that, the, is that the time period? Um, over the last 17 17 years. 17, 18 years, yes. <clears throat> and um, w what you're looking at there is a raw number. And at the same time as the, 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 there's a raw number decline, the population of Durham has been increasing at a very high rate. Uh, and so I would be interested if this is only if this is easy. Uh, but I would love to see the crime rate decline over the same period of time. This is the raw number decline, as I understand it. Did I get that wrong? Mayor, it, yeah. it, it, per Oh, gosh, per 100,000. Got it. Mm -hmm. You already had it for me. Thank you. Always ahead of me. Thank you very much. Um, so what we see in this report overall is we see <coughs> over the last years, uh, violent crime down 11%, the crime rate, property crime rate down 49%. Uh, but in, then in more recent years, we see, um, in, in, in this last year, last, last few years, we see traffic stops declining precipitously. We see searches declining precipitously. We see U visa certifications up. We see drug offense use, drug offenses down. We see misdemeanor diversion court use up. I just think that this is increasingly a very um, community-friendly police department. And I want to commend you, I want to commend the command staff, and I want to consent, con commend the members of the department <clears throat> for making these, this change. This is a profoundly uh, different department than we, <clears throat> than we have had, and um, I just want to thank you all for it because I think this is, nothing is more important in Durham than this work, and I uh, really appreciate you doing it. All right, any other questions or comments? I think the Mayor Pro Tem, I thought I saw her. I did, Mayor Pro Tem. everyone has already said all the things I was going to say. I just wanted to reiterate that with, a, with very few exceptions, all the numbers in this report are moving in the right direction, and I think that's a real accomplishment. And as, as a numbers person, I really appreciate that. I think um, more than anything else um, that this is some real concrete evidence of the changes that are being made in this city. Um, and that I think that they're gonna have a really significant impact on the folks in this community. So thank you and thank you to your staff for, um, for taking this seriously and for, for making this happen. Thank you, thank you. Thank you very much. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Chief. Thanks to everyone, uh, all the members of the department who are here. We're grateful to you. And uh, thanks for sticking with us so long there, Chief. Thank you, sir. Um, and I believe that that is the final item on our agenda. And if there is no other business to come before this council, I will only, before adjourning, warn my council colleagues that the next council next Monday is a very large and long agenda, so uh, we'll be getting out of here later than this. Uh, so with that, I will say that the meeting is adjourned at 8.41 p.m.